cruising at 38,000 feet. Cockpit's quiet, autopilot's engaged, systems are stable. Hum of the engines, a few checklist callouts, maybe a shared joke between the pilots. Everything feels routine. Then, suddenly, the route ahead is no longer available. The airspace you were planning to fly through, closed. No warning, no delay. Sure, you can turn back, but that's not where you're meant to go. So what do you do when there's no pause button at 500 knots and the map just changed mid-flight? In this video, I'll take you inside the cockpit, show you what really happens when a flight plan suddenly falls apart. How we make decisions, how we assess our options, and how we still get everyone to the right place safely, even when the plan doesn't survive the cruise. Airspace closures aren't hypothetical, they happen. Sometimes due to political escalation, sometimes due to military activity, sometimes without any public warning at all. And when they do, it changes everything. Here's what most people don't realize. You can't pull over at the nearest cloud and wait it out. The aircraft is moving, the fuel is burning, and the boundary of that now closed airspace is getting closer by the second. But despite how sudden it might seem, it's rarely a complete surprise. Before every flight, we review NOTAMs, regional risk summaries, geopolitical hotspots. And even after takeoff, we're constantly updating our mental map. We don't just fly the route, we fly the what ifs. What if this airway closes? What if the alternate becomes unavailable? What if the weather shifts? We brief it. We plan for it. We know where we'd go if the worst should happen. So when the map changes mid-flight, we're not guessing. We're already thinking three moves ahead. Before we start making big picture decisions, we begin with the basics. Fly the aircraft. It sounds obvious, but in high workload situations, it's worth saying out loud. Who's flying? Who's talking? And what's the aircraft actually doing? Quick check of the FMA, the flight path, system status, lays the groundwork. It gives us shared situational awareness and ensures we're not trying to solve tomorrow's problems before dealing with today's priorities. When you're dealing with high stakes situations at altitude, structure matters. That's why pilots are trained to use decision-making models, frameworks that help us keep calm and methodical under pressure. You might've heard of models like GRADE or FORDEC. They all follow a similar logic, assess the situation, weigh your options, make a decision and review it. They're all valid, and depending on where you trained or which airline you fly for, you might be taught one over another. Personally, my go-to is a model called T-DODA. I find it clear, structured, and flexible enough to apply in a variety of real-world scenarios, like, say, when the airspace in front of you just vanished. Time. How much time do we actually have before we must act? That question sets the tone, pace, and urgency for everything that follows. Time can be measured in seconds, say, if there's smoke in the cockpit, or in fuel flow, track miles, and mental bandwidth. If you're dealing with fire or fumes, there's very little thinking time. You act. Then there are the other kinds of scenarios, the ones where time is on your side, like being told to expect a delay into Heathrow while you're still somewhere over Bulgaria. You've got a solid hour to think, plan, rebrief, overthink, and probably still have time to make a coffee before making a single radio call. Glorious. Sometimes, you judge time available by how fast that little green aircraft symbol is closing in on a big red patch of closed airspace. Spoiler alert, that's not time to start designing the perfect plan. That's time to start making a good one. Whatever the scenario, understanding how much time you've got and using it wisely sets the cadence for every decision that follows. This step, diagnose, is where good decisions begin. You simply can't make the right call unless you first understand what's actually going on. It's not just a formality, it's the foundation. Without a clear diagnosis, every option that follows is just guesswork dressed up in procedure. That means gathering information from every available source. It could be a system message on the ECAM, something raised by the cabin crew, a conversation with ATC, or a weather update from the dispatcher. It might come from a checklist, a QRH reference, a company ops briefing, or the insight of the other pilot beside you. And in many situations, the most useful questions are the simplest. What exactly is the problem? 
What's causing it? How reliable is the information that we're working with? Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes it's ambiguous. And sometimes you're working with conflicting inputs that you have to piece together on the fly. But if you skip the diagnosis or rush it, you're just guessing. Then we generate options and filter each one with a simple but vital question. Can we? And that means asking more than just whether we can touch down, for example. Can we get there, considering airspace restrictions, aircraft status and fuel? Can we accept the most likely approach safely? Can we perform a missed approach should it come to it? Can we turn the aircraft around? By that I mean, what happens after we land? Can we park the aircraft? Are there handling agents? Is customs available? Can we refuel? Are we within crew duty limits? What's the local engineering support like? Are there regional or political considerations that might complicate things further? Some airports look fine on a chart, but in reality might be completely unusable for your situation. The can we filter is where we start thinking beyond the wheels down moment and start considering the entire operational picture. After that, we decide. Not necessarily on the perfect solution. In time critical scenarios, perfection is a luxury. The goal is to make a good decision that's safe, practical and workable. And it's rarely a solo call. We'll often consult with our company operations team because as much as we're in command of the aircraft, we're still one part of a much larger machine. Then we assign roles, clearly. Who's flying? Who's monitoring? Who's talking to ATC? Good workload management isn't about showing how much you can personally juggle. It's about using your resources wisely and keeping the aircraft flying safely. Finally, we review, continuously. We ask open questions like, what have we missed? Rather than the closed, did we miss anything? Because the former invites your crew to share that quiet doubt they might be holding on to. And in this business, quiet doubts are sometimes some of the loudest warning signs. Always, always have a plan B and a plan C and ideally a plan D tucked up your sleeve too. While we're juggling all that, the cabin remains quiet. Eventually, passengers here, due to a restriction ahead, will be taking a slightly longer route tonight. What they don't hear is, we just rerouted around an active conflict zone with 20 minutes notice. And that's exactly how it should be. So, the next time you hear, due to a slight rerouting, just know that behind the scenes, a lot of decisions were being made, quickly, calmly, and with structure. If you found this helpful, or if you've ever wondered how we handle unexpected curveballs at 38,000 feet, feel free to like, subscribe, or leave a comment below. And if you've got your own mid-air reroute story, I'd love to hear it.